Church, amen. amen. Proverbs chapter 6. What a blessing to be back in the Lord's house. I hope you spent your hour in prayer last evening and today. And that is a very important part of the revival services. I said that is a very important part of the revival services. And we need to practice that all throughout the week. And I know it's surprisingly easy to get in an hour, especially if you break it up, perhaps 10-minute intervals or depending on your schedule, every how you can do it, and uh, spend time in prayer. Uh, there's something about that. I mean, you know, you can spend some time praying for the missionary and the preacher and, and the health of your loved ones, but by and by the Holy Spirit will begin to put His finger on things that that we need to deal with our, in our own lives. Especially if you start thinking about how you've prayed that before and nothing happened. Uh, God delights in answering prayer. And if, and if your prayers are not being answered, then there's something wrong and it's not with Him. Amen. And so uh, we really need to, to pray. Uh, and that is a very, very important part of the service. I'm excited about the meeting more now than it was uh, last night, really, because the way the Lord has dealt with my heart. And I was uh, in prayer today about the meeting, and the Lord directed me to our passage tonight and uh, that I had not planned to read. And He said, you preach that tonight. And I said, yes, sir. And, but that encouraged me because I see that God is dealing with my heart, and I know He's dealing with your heart. And He's going to help us, Amen. He's going to help us. Let's look at this passage now, and I assure you that it's straight from the heart of God. I know when the Lord deals with my heart, and, and uh, I'm not here to peck on anyone. As a matter of fact, I don't, I, don't, you know, I don't know enough about you to peck on you, but I'm just simply saying that I'm reading to you as a man sent from God, and I know for certain that he laid this verse on my heart, these verses in Proverbs 6, beginning at verse uh, 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Now, I, I know that I know that some will be sensitive to some of the things that I'm going to say. I make no apology for it. I can prove what I'm preaching with the Bible. And as, as is our normal approach, I'll just take the verses, take this list of things, and talk to us a few minutes about holy hatred. Holy hatred. It's amazing how a sovereign God can still take pleasure in His people, as He said in one of those last Psalms, maybe 147, for the Lord taketh pleasure in His people, and how that we have the potential to excite the heart of God and to give Him pleasure. Isn't that a thought after Calvary? that we could actually excite the heart of God. And then when I see him in the book of Hosea's prophecy saying that he has a quarrel with us, a controversy, then we can affect him in the negative realm as well. And we know that he loves us. Church, say amen. amen. But it's, and if you're saved, you love him. But it's possible, maybe even likely, that even though we love the Lord, there could be something in our lifestyle, in our vocabulary, our wardrobe, in our schedule, in our personality, some something that God actually hates. Wouldn't that be tragic? To stand before Him after Calvary and come to the startling realization that we had been harboring some activity or whatever in our life <clears throat> that God actually hates. This Bible 
doesn't just tell us who he is, it tells us who we are. And we need to face it. We need to face it. And revival is getting right. Amen. Revival is getting right. In your reference Bible, Proverbs chapter 1 through chapter 7 uh, is called Instructions for Righteousness. And we know we have imputed righteousness through the Lord Jesus, and that will keep you out of hell, amen. amen. But then there's some practical righteousness that's possible because of imputed righteousness. And there again, it's not filthy rags. Only if you're trying to be saved by your works is your righteousness filthy rags. And so my reference Bible says exhortations to sons, and certainly that's daughters. And so the Word of God is exhorting us to practical righteousness. God wants His guys and gals to do right, church. Say amen. amen. So let's look now at these verses for a few minutes. I'm not trying not to keep it too long, but I want to preach everything the Lord tells me to preach. Yes, and uh, so let's just, uh, let's just be real sensitive and try to concentrate and give the Lord some prime time and don't allow our minds to wander off uh, in some of Walt Disney's witchcraft and just kind of stay, stay here in the building, you know, and let the Lord speak to our hearts. And night by night, challenge by challenge, we climb the Mount of Beatitudes uh, and, and, and blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so we want to just keep making a little progress. The Lord helped us last night. Oh, I guarantee you He did. He helped us last night, and He'll help us tonight if, if we'll let Him. He wants to do it worse than we want it. He's not tardy. Amen. He's not delinquent. He'll do His part. We just need to yield right away to Him. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the song service. Thank you, Lord, for all of the warm, friendly smiles and greetings. Thank you for this good crowd on Tuesday night, this excellent crowd. And thank you, Lord, that you are here. And thank you for the privilege we have to have and read a King James Bible. And thank you for the Holy Spirit that wrote the Bible, taking up his residence in our hearts and in our lives. And I pray now for the Holy Ghost anointing to come upon thy servant. For Lord, I know and you know that I can do absolutely nothing by myself, but I'm not by myself. And I'm trusting you, Lord, to, as the brother prayed earlier, to anoint uh, the preacher and then anoint the ears of the people. Surely on the day of Pentecost, I mean, when, when old Simon Peter preached in one language, but all that crowd from a dozen different dialects, they heard him uh, in their language. And so there was an anointing of the ear and the hearing and so I pray tonight that, that you would anoint our hearts to hear and receive the truth of God's Word. Show us, Lord, how serious it is to live uh, out of your will. And then show us the wonderful, sweet peace and grace of resting in your love. Bless now, and I pray for that soul here that's lost, that the Spirit of the Lord would tug at their heart and give them a hunger and a thirst for Jesus. Have mercy upon us all. And help saints to rejoice and sinners to repent and believe the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Keep your Bible open to the place uh, in Proverbs chapter 6, beginning at verse number 16. Now here the Bible names six, seven things that are an abomination unto himself. And I think in Sunday school, on Sunday morning, someone mentioned abomination or abominable. And so I don't know how long it's been since uh, you've had a lesson on it. Really don't care. But, I, but I, I have learned that your pastor is a very thorough preacher and a good Bible student. And, uh, and he's, uh, he's, he continues to impress me. I don't want to brag on him too much. He doesn't have enough hair to cover his head now. But, uh, but you're very fortunate, very fortunate to have Pastor Hammett here. And, and uh, he, ha he knows that he has a responsibility to give you everything that God gives him. And, uh, but if he's talked about this, then it, the Lord's just telling me you need to hear it again. Now, this word abominable or abominably or abomination 
appears in the New Testament eight times and in the Old Testament 166 times, and I want to preach on them all. But we'll, but we'll not. Church, say amen. amen. But stay right here. Don't be so enthusiastic. Stay right here in this passage in Proverbs chapter 6 and just look at these six things, yea, seven, are an abomination unto the Lord. And the word abomination and abominable uh, really gets serious when you start studying uh, the root words and the meaning, the definition of the words, especially those from the Old Testament. And uh, the King James Bible is so beautiful in that oftentimes it drops a word on you and then it explains it, like Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And I saw that studying this word abomination. He said in Jeremiah 44, 4, he said, uh, Oh, do not this abominable thing which I hate, which I hate. And uh, that, that uh, word there, which I hate, is the same one that we're dealing with, this word uh, toyabal. And toyabal means something that God hates. And so the King James Bible there in Jeremiah gave you the word abomination, and then immediately he defined it from the Hebrew uh, so you know exactly what that particular word means. And it's something that God hates. And that's the word in our text tonight, translated abomination, thus the title, holy hatred. And then there's the Hebrew word shaket, which means something that's uh, mixed up, good and bad is mixed up. I guess the best way to interpret is just to say something polluted. And it's a picture of the ointment, the high priest ointment uh, for, or for incense, and then an insect falls in it, and it's polluted. Or as we say in the Blue Ridge, fly in the buttermilk, shoo, 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 skip to Maloo, my darling. And you see when something is good and it's bad, and you know, we'll, we, we want to see the good, especially if it's someone you like. And you make up your mind, I like that girl, I like that boy. And so you're not looking for anything wrong. But then on the other hand, if it's someone you're a little jealous of or prejudiced against, you're looking for something that's wrong. But God sees it like it is. And when there's something wonderful about you and then there's something that's awful about you, then that that is wonderful is suddenly uh, polluted. It's shock at. And so then, then... When the ugly gets on the ape, then it, there's no positive to it. Now there is, to us, you know, when we, we see a fella or a girl, you know, and we will say, I mean, he's this and this and this and this, but then that, but this and this, and, and you know, we kind of divide it up. And we really love and appreciate that that's good, and then we kind of ignore that that's bad. But God doesn't do it like that. And the good is polluted by the bad. She's a wonderful girl. She's faithful and clean and a virgin and never misses church and smokes cigarettes. Well, I mean, I'm not going to fall out with her about that. I hope the Lord helps her before she dies with cancer. But I'm just saying God doesn't see it like that. The bad pollutes the good. So it takes on a note of, of seriousness when you see the meaning of these words, you know, he's a fine young man, and, and but he checks out beer down at the local grocery store, and on and on. Uh, and so then, Shawkat, Toyabal, something God hates. Shawkat, something that's good, but it's polluted. And then there's Pigul. And I usually call it pig glue because it helps me to remember the definition. It means something that stinks. Pig glue, like an old pig sty, that old soured mud that they love. And pigul means something that has an offensive odor. And I thought, well, God can see so well and He can hear us when we think. You mean He can smell too? Yes, He can. And he has a very sensitive nose and a very nosy nose and a very powerful nose. With a blast of his nostril, he parted the Red Sea. Had he sneezed, he'd have blown the world away. With a blast of his nostril, 
That's what the Bible said. That's what the Bible said. You want to hear the truth say amen? amen. If you want to hear a lie, you should have gone to the Methodist church. And so God's nostril is very powerful. The Bible is God breathed. That's a pretty powerful source, I would say. And he's been sniffing around here lately. He's been <laughs> around your house and my house. I live in a mobile home parked back here. And as he sniffs around, he may smell something like the pleasant aroma of the high priestly prayer, the incense going up as we intercede for one another. And then he might sniff up something that stinks. He may even find something that's nauseating. Isn't it something that God has senses like you and I have senses even though God is a spirit? He has personality and he has emotions and has senses. Isn't that an amazing thing? And so these three words from the Old Testament, uh, this word abomination, it means something that God hates. It means something that's polluted. Polluted. Oh, I can feel, I can feel something when I say that. Is your life polluted? Is my life polluted? With the good that the grace of God has placed in you, is there something there that's, that's spoiling it? And then something that stinks. And with the love and the appreciation that we have for Jesus, could it be possible there's something in our lifestyle that, that, that sends up an offensive odor to God? And so revival is it's, it's asking the Lord and it's seeking His face and then it's turning from our wicked ways. And so studying the Bible and Bible sessions and Bible preaching uh, so, like we're involved in now, it helps us to, you know, to see ourselves like we really are and to look into the mirror. A lot of times we Baptists are real, we're real specialists at taking the Bible and making a, a magnifying glass out of it and magnifying the faults of others. And then sometimes we take a telescope, make a telescope out of it. All we want to talk about is the deep things of the future and the great prophetic utterances of the future. We don't want to deal with the nasty now and now. We just want to think about the sweet by and by. But instead of using the King James Bible for a telescope or a magnifying glass, we need to make it a mirror. Like old brother James said, or he, he referred to that, didn't he? And then not just see those important things way out there and not just see the, the blemishes and the, the moat that's in our buddy's eye, but we might see ourselves as we really are and, and then let repentance be forthcoming. So revival is, is, has many aspects, and one shows the necessity of Bible preaching, Bible preaching and Bible reading and Bible study that we might see in the book. That's right. Hallelujah. And that's wrong. Quit it. Stop it. Go and sin no more, he told the girl. He said, well, he didn't, con he didn't condone either. He said, go and sin no more. Quit it. Amen. Amen. Hang in there, preacher. Hang in there. Look now at these verses and we'll be done and all the fat people can go eat again. Say amen, fat boys. <laughs> watch, watch these things now. And, and it won't, won't take long. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. A proud look. Oh, I know I've mentioned that, but let me mention it again. A proud look. We really think we're something. I mean, we really do. And, and, and we primped and got ready to come tonight, want to look right and act right, feel right and smell right and, and put out our snuff so we can spit white and we came to the house of God. And listen, we're a proud lot. I mean, one lady wouldn't come because she'd had a bad hair day all day. I've had a bad hair day all day, but I can't. <laughs> and then someone didn't come because on the way out the door, their socks had a red sock on this and a blue sock on that one. And then someone didn't come because you forgot to wash your car. And there's so many things. You know, that dandruff treatment didn't work, and it'll take you three or four days to get back to the house of God. We're so proud we're rotten. And out of all of the sins that this Bible enumerates, nothing makes us more like the devil than pride. No sin identifies me more as a devil than pride. 
It's pride. It's pride. It's pride. I know you folks are not pimps and prostitutes and potheads. I realize that. Most of you are even Republicans. But it's pride, it's pride, and it identifies. There's two things, and I'll deal with the other one directly. But this thing of pride, nothing makes, you see, that's the original sin. Not in the garden. There was one before that, and it was in heaven. And nothing makes me more like the devil. Than, and I know there's all these awful vices and all these unmentionables, oh, but nothing makes us more like the devil. Nothing makes you more like the devil than pride, than pride. Perhaps if, if we could just repent of our pride, revival would break out from here to Philadelphia. If we could just repent of our pride, oh, it's an awful sin. I say it's an awful sin. And you can be clean as a pen and, and everyone admire you and, and be exemplary in every facet of your personality and that old wolf of pride have you by the hind leg all the time. So it's a very, very serious thing. God doesn't just say pride. He said a proud look. And you remember about Ahab and, and, and even though he's a bunch of phony baloney, but when he started acting humble, it got God's attention when he just pretended to be humble. And Paul said, put on humility. Listen, if you're proud, you better not act proud. We ought to try to be humble. We ought to try to look humble. Try to put ourselves down and say, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thyself be all. But no, it's not me. It's not me. Even if we do have pride in our heart, and we do, we need to act humbly. We need to talk with humility. We need to dress with humility. We need to try to cultivate some humility in our and our personality and the way we brag on our I mean, it's us four and it's no more. And I mean, my grandchildren, man, we've already got them enrolled in, in higher education. I mean, it's, and, and, and it's always, it's me and mine and me and mine and mine. And no wonder the middle letter in sin is I. It's self, self, selfishness. Us four, no more. Let the world go to hell. That's why you came in the night with no one in your back seat. Uh, a proud look. And then the next one is, uh, now this, this word, ruim, it means to be high, to act high, to exalt self, to want to be seen, to want to have, and then the second one is a lying tongue. Now I'm preaching on six things, just the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. Holy hatred from Proverbs chapter 6. Do you have the place? Say Amen. And the first one is a proud look. God hates it. It, it doesn't really, it's not very noticeable because we all are involved in it. So it doesn't stand out so much, you know. My pride doesn't stand out so much. Yours doesn't because we're all eaten up with it. And we need to repent of it. Amen. I think, and, and I know that God deserves our best, and, and, and I love to, to bathe and comb my hair and put on a clean outfit and come to the house of God, but sometimes I wonder if that's what we ought to do. Sometimes I think maybe we ought to come in in sackcloth and ashes. Sometimes I think we ought to put on a shirt that's been, buttonholes have been ripped out of it or something, and just, just I mean, Lester Roloff said sometimes I take a cold shower. He said it hurts so much it must be good for me spiritually. And sometimes I think, well, to just somebody say, your socks don't match. Yeah, I know. And just come somehow try to put on some humility. And I don't know how, how, how much good it would do, but it'd certainly be a relief from all of this pride. That, that, and we strut around, and we're offended if someone doesn't compliment us on the way we look or something. Amen. Amen. So it's a proud look. Then it's a lying tongue. So the, the number one thing that identifies us with the devil is pride. The number two thing is telling lies because he's a liar and the father of it. But there, but there, 
Excuse me, there again, it's just a way of life. I mean, just politicians lie and preachers lie and salesmen lie. There might be a few car salesmen in heaven, but not many. I said it like that because there might be one here. I mean, the professional world is just full of liars. And they call it salesmanship. And they're telling you a lie. Or they're not telling you both sides of the thing. You know, there's, and they're deceiving you. So if you're deceiving someone, you're a liar, you're a liar. Your pants is on fire. Hang your crooked nose on a telephone wire. You're a liar, you're a liar. And you know, you know I want to tell you this and, and not apologize. If you're a liar, you're not going to God's heaven when you die. Now, he said, all preachers, sin, sin. I know that, but God is specific about some things. He said, but the fearful, now that's a coward. While some of you believe in Christ, you want to be a child of God, you have that much sense. You don't want to go to hell when you die. You want to be saved. You just kind of hold back. You just kind of hold back. And in the invitation, something in you saying, yes, go to Jesus, go to Jesus. You said, well, well, later, well, well, when I get older, well, after I get married, well, 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 you're a coward. You're a wimp. I said, you're a wimp. You're a coward. You ought to be man enough, woman enough to turn your back on the devil. Turn your back on hell. Turn your back on sin. Turn your back on that crowd that crucified Jesus and come to this altar and say, Dear God, have mercy upon me and forgive me of my sins and save me. Please save me, Lord. Amen. But you're a coward. Well, you're right here in Revelation 21 8. He said, But the fearful and unbelieving, opposite of the believing. Oh, he said, I'm a believer. Well, no, that word believe means trust, dependence, and commitment. And unbelieving means you don't trust and you're, you're not committed. And when you're committed to Christ, you're committed to his church. Jesus. You can't be committed to Christ and lay out a church. Yeah, right. And the abominable, there's our word, you thought I was running a rabbit. And the abominable and murderers, and if you killed your baby, you are one, and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all Liars. That's what it says. It says, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If you are an habitual liar, whatever you are, you're not a child of God. You might be a Methodist. You might be a Catholic. You might be a, a Presbyterian. You might be a Baptist. But you're not born of the Spirit of God. You're not a child of God if you're a liar because a child of God is not going to the lake of fire. Hallelujah. If you're saved, buddy, you're going to heaven. Amen. Well, Brother Earl Hughes said, I'm glad I'm not going to hell. And Phyllis said, hey, you know you're not going to hell. He said, because I'm not heading in that direction. Amen. Couldn't say that with beer on his breath, could he, buddy? Mark her down. The proof's in the pudding. That changed heart will cause you to be very sensitive about telling the truth. We make all kind of jokes about it and say, well, oh, so-and-so really uh, handles the truth uh, a little carelessly or, or something like that. But listen, this Bible says liars are lost. And of all the things that the Bible says about the devil, he's a liar and the father of it. He is a liar. He's a deceiver. Now, he's into drugs and murder and all this. He's into religion. But he's into deception bigger than he's in anything. He is a deceiver. That's his thing. He is a liar. Pride makes us like the devil. Telling lies makes us like the devil. His main talent is deception. That's his main thing. I became acquainted with a, a young missionary named Marvin Porch. And Marvin went to Borneo and spent his natural life and just recently has checked out and uh, moved to heaven. But he told me in Borneo that he came to this tribe to work, and there hadn't been a work there, before, and he said, I believe every person in the tribe was, was possessed, demon-possessed. I don't know what term you use, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Had devils in them. He said, I have reason to believe every person in the tribe was devil-possessed. 
And he said they were not into a lot of wicked things like, like you'd think. But he said, he said the joy of their life was to trick someone. Now, he said, you've seen practical jokers and all, and all that. He said, they were, just, they were just possessed with this drive to deceive. He said, they'd rather deceive you than anything. It'd make their day. It'd make their month, especially if they could deceive one another. He said, I was so vulnerable to, to the thing, and then they just played joke on me after joke. And he said, then I began to watch them and watch their eyes and, 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 and watch the chill bumps come up on their neck when they realized they'd tricked me again. He said, one day I was standing outside and a canoe was coming down the river. And he said, as that canoe came down the river, he said, the men began to run out and wave. He said, I looked at the marks on the canoe and it was from another tribe 60 miles upstream. And he said, the men were showing their big white teeth and said, yes, yes. And they were wading out in the water and waving at this fellow. And he said, this fellow was pulling up paddle and he was by himself and you could tell he was about starved. And he said, they were just, just giving him a warm, he said, as warm a welcome as they knew how to give. And the man came gliding in and they took all of his canoe. He said, the chief went out and embraced him. And he said they got him out of the canoe and they began to try to talk with him and, and, and the dialect was similar enough till they could communicate. And he said they brought him in and started fixing a big pig and started make, making a feast. And he said they had a dance and they just really welcomed this fellow. He said then the next day they had this big festival the next day and the priest gave this stranger his daughter to wife and they built him a hut. And he said I'm looking at all this. And so the men are so, so heartily given of themselves and giving them food. And it's the time of the year when they should have had food stored up and doing for him. And they build his hut and they're making his furniture and they've given him a wife. And he said they're just treating him like he's a king, like he's, like he's a messiah. They're just so happy that he's there. And he said, I, I don't know what's going on. He said, I, I, part of them are cannibal. And he said, I thought the first thing they'd do is, is you know, kill him. But no, they're treating him like a king. He said, a couple of years later, I'm still there. The little wife has had a baby. He said, then one night I heard the drum and it called a meeting. I joined them with him. And he said, we went to this man's door. And said so they got over his door with torches, had torches over the door and beside of the door so they could all see his face. He said, then they knocked on the door. And when he came to the door, the butcher stepped up with a knife. And he said, they told him that they deceived him. And he said the look on his face was more than enough reward for their demon-possessed hearts as they filleted that man and ate him in that evening meal. They built him a house, gave him a wife. She had a baby by him, the chief's daughter. All of that effort and over two years' time just for that one exhilarating moment Second, when they could see him go, and they went, <laughs> and they lived through all of those weeks and months and whispered behind his back just to come to that climax, just to come to that moment when he knew he'd been canned. That's the devil. That's the devil. That's the power of a lie. That's the demonic act of deception. I'm telling you, demon-possessed people, but instead of being involved in a lot of things you might imagine, they lived, they just lived to lie. They just lived to tell you. They, they just... That little boy of yours, that little girl that you're always having to spank for telling lies, that teenager may have never tasted a cigarette, but if she's a liar, she's lost. That teenage boy may never have smelt of a can of beer, but if he's a liar, he's lost. All of your children may be virtuous, but if they're liars, they're lost. If you're a liar, you're lost. You'll go to hell when you die with your baptismal certificate and your perfect attendance on Sunday school and your Christian school diploma. You'll still fry in hell if you die a liar. 
six things are an abomination unto God, yea, seven. Six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, number two, a lying tongue, number three, and hands that shed innocent blood. You immediately think about uh, abortion. I do. <laughs> the greatest social sin of this day perhaps is not sodomy, but abortion. At least the victim of the sodomite could still hear the gospel and live on. Out of all of the mess of our society, abortion must cause America to stink in the nostrils of a thrice holy God. 4,650 a day. While we're begging God for revival, the blood of the unborn is running in the stinking sewers of Pennsylvania. It is an abomination unto God. It is an abomination unto God. I heard this doctor who had been saved by the grace of God said he went into this community to speak at this Baptist church in central South Carolina. And it was a large work, and he asked for permission. It was a lady doctor. She asked for permission to speak to the ladies and to lecture them and explain the abortion racket. And he said, well, sure, I mean, that'll be fine. They have their meeting, uh, and you can meet with them. But he said, you're wasting your time, man. He said, I preach again it. And he said, we hand out literature against it in our church, and I preach again it. And he said, but it might be a deterrent. It might reinforce what I've been preaching. But he said, there's no one in our church that's had an abortion. She said, when I finished, I found out the pastor's wife had had five. And some of you are having abortions. <laughs> I don't know, but God knows. God knows. And that quack that you paid to kill that child, that is first degree murder for hire. And I believe it's a stench in the nostrils of a thrice holy God. Hands that shed innocent blood. And then he said, hearts that breed wicked imagine. Oh, you talk about, you talk about getting down to the house where we live. This is talking about uh, daydreaming and fantasizing. And a lot, of, a lot of the fantasy and the dreams that you have before you go to sleep, you know, them dreams you have during the day in Christian school, those dreams you have while you're running that old slow machine over there at the shop, and those dreams you have when you're, when you're driving, you know, when you're awake, a lot of that is because, you know, junk in, yeah. junk out, kind of like a, com like a computer, you know. In order for me to live right, I must think right. And I can't think right unless I read the right kind of material, unless I look at the right kind of pictures and, 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 and the eye gate and the ear gate. I mean, I have to censor and limit what comes in because when it comes in, it becomes a, a part of me. I can look at something that is obscene and then I took a colored instamatic color picture of it and filed it back there in that x-rated file and I can call it up anytime time I want to. If it's been 30 years, I can just call it right up and look at it. Isn't that something how God gave us this memory bank and, and not just for good things, but for, as a matter of fact, you have to continually rehearse a verse of Scripture or you'll forget it. But you can remember an old joke you heard, you know, one of them dirty jokes about the white horse that fell in the mud hole. And you can remember that way on down the road, even though you haven't repeated it for 50 years. I'm talking about jokes my uncles told me 55 years ago. I can remember a couple of them. Oh, I wouldn't tell you, and I haven't repeated them. But then if I'm going to quote a verse of Scripture, I might have to look it up and kind of freshen up on it a little. I'll tell you, it seems like that, that our flesh is on the devil's side. Amen. And so we have this heart that breeds, and this has to do with enlarging upon and embellishing, and, and so you see some little something on the television, or you hear some little something, or you read some little something, and then the, the heart takes it. The heart takes it. You say it's the mind. Well, it's the heart too. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. 
That's why it's so important that we read the right material and that we watch the right kind of things and, and that we guard our eyes and guard our ears because when you get that in there, just like a computer, if it's junk in, it's junk out, and when it gets in there, it begins to breed and enlarge and say, well, what if it happened this way and, and what if it happened that way? And you say, what's the big deal? All right, right, here's the big deal. These things doth the Lord hate a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Oh, I can't explain that. I just have to tell you that's what it says. God said, I hate a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. That's why it's so important we, we guard the little sanctuary of our mind and not allow this to creep in or that to creep Oh, there's no harm done. There will be by and by. You just think you forgot about it. But there'll be some place, somewhere, sometime when that'll pop up and you'll begin to enlarge on that thing. And God said, I hate hearts that devise with wicked imaginations. Don't let your children sit and watch Disney's witchcraft and expect them to have a pure mind. They can't have a pure mind and watch television. Hey Amen. Hang in there. They cannot. Listen. You can be saved by the grace of God and have a television with a screen on it, 10 foot square. But you will never be filled with the Holy Ghost. You will never be 100% yielded to God as long as you watch that thing. You will be carnal. You cannot help but be carnal. You said that ain't popular. I didn't come here to be popular. No one will ever enjoy the Spirit-filled life and sit down and watch that programming. And I know it's a tool that can be used, and, and all I've heard all that. Okay, okay, okay. But I mean, I know you're strong. You can handle it, but I can't handle it. I just soon have a rattlesnake in my nursery as to have one of them filthy things in my house. Oh, come on, folk. Don't look at me like that. Well, I love you. I'm trying to be a blessing to you. I'm trying to be a blessed. You can't watch that filthy thing and walk in the Spirit of God. He said, walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And God said, I hate a heart that sits around and imagines this and imagines that. And, and that's, what, that's where it starts. That's where those seeds of bad thoughts, you didn't get it from mom or dad. You got it from watching that hell box. And you know what? And, and it just breeds these. And God said, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And all the cutting and the shooting and the gutting and the gallbladders. And God said, hey, hey, he said, and he that loveth violence, my soul hateth. My soul. And we, man, we wouldn't watch. I mean, if I couldn't see old Matt Dillon out shoot that fella. <laughs> I walked in a pawn shop in South Carolina, and, and there the television was on. This fellow had a shotgun, sawed off, double barrel, and he pulled them triggers. And all the, the camera magic or whatever, and those buckshot went through that fellow, and there was lungs all over the wall. Man, it blowed holes through him, and there was blood splattered all over that, all over that wall, and that fellow, and blood started hemorrhaging and gushing out of him. And, 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 and I, I mean, we wouldn't go to a car race if you didn't think you'd see a wreck once in a while. Violence, violence, it's not just sex. It's violence, violence, violence. Stab him, club him, stomp him. One fellow said he sat up one night and watched a program and said this fellow was chopping people's heads off and eating their brains. And that entertains, I mean, that entertains. This low-down stinking world is sick, sick, it's sick. This world is sick. I mean, that's what entertains, and if that entertains you, you're sick. The Bible said Lot vexed his righteous soul from seeing and hearing the deeds of the Sodomites. That's TV. That's what that here. TV. Lot was not a Sodomite. Lot was not a Sodomite. But Lot lived in a community of Sodom, and he watched men kissing men and women fondling women and and the Bible said it vexed, that word means sick enough to have the covers pulled up. It means 
Vexed means prostrate with sickness. So you're so sick, you're flat out, prostrate with sickness. Not his body, but his soul. He vexed. He made his soul sick from day to day because he was living in a place because he worked with one, went to school with one, bought his gasoline from one, bought his groceries from another one. We better stay away from that junk. According to the Bible, it can vex your soul. Hearts that breed wicked imaginations. And then he said, I hate feet that run to do mischief. Now mischief here is rude and it's ill-mannered and it's disrespectful. What's wrong with some good old-fashioned manners? What has happened to our children? What's wrong with daddy opening up the door for mama? Instead of saying, come on, you old bag. What's wrong with being polite? What's wrong with helping mother on with her sweater? What's wrong with teaching it to our children? What's wrong with saying, yes, sir, and no, ma'am? That's not just old-fashioned. It's good manners, and the Bible teaches good manners. As a matter of fact, it teaches it right here. This word mischief means to be foul-mouthed, bad language, ill-mannered, mischief, mischief. And he, God said, I hate feet that run to do mischief. He said, I hate false witnesses. That's kind of overlapping with a liar. And then lastly, he said, I hate he that soweth discord among brethren. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but I can't skip it, okay? I'm trying to be fair. I am. I'm trying to be fair and honest in my exposition and application. Now watch this. God, not, not Brother Rufus, but God has selected these six, these first six things, and he has testified that he hates a certain part of the body which is involved in committing the act. I hate the hands of the abortion doctor. And I hate the tongue of the liar. And I hate the feet. Of what, did, you see, did you notice that? <laughs> now that's what it says. He said, I hate a proud look. A lying tongue. So he hates the look of the proud, the tongue of the liar, the hands of the abortionist. I hate a heart that devises wicked imaginations. I hate feet that be swift to run to mischief. I hate false witnesses that speak lies. And he... that soweth discord among brethren. Now, I didn't write it now. Don't blame me with it. And don't ask me how he can hate and love. Ask him. But he said it, and that settles it. The low down, this wickedest person in this town is not the abortion doctor. It's not the smut peddler. The low down, this wickedest thing is, it's you. If you. Now, Pastor, I, uh, the only reason I mention this, Pastor, is because I know you'll help me pray. Now, now I've been seeing Ralph's car parked over at Susie's a whole lot lately. Oh, I know there's nothing going on, preacher. There can't be anything going on. But, preacher, I, the only reason I mention this is because I know you'll, you'll help me pray. You hypocrite! You're sowing discord among brethren. When you drop just a word, you're just a word there. Just, and sometimes just an insinuation. Sometimes body language. Like, like I say, uh, do, you know, do you know Pastor uh, so-and-so? And you say, some lady say, I'll say I know him. Now what did she say? Nothing? True, she said nothing. But she insinuated that she knows something real spicy about this dude, and she wouldn't dare tell me, oh, no, I wouldn't want to gossip. <laughs> I wouldn't want to gossip. Yeah. Well, you said you know him. I'll say I know him. And then the next time I see that fella, now she didn't tell me anything. So the next time I see him, I'm going to say, I wonder if he's crooked. 
Because that, well, surely not. No, but, and then 25 years later, if I see him, I'll say, well, that old boy could be crooked. Especially if I see him somewhere talking to a lady. And if we sow discord among brethren, and if we're a bunch of gossips, and if we're always on that telephone and always said, well, what'd you think about this? And what'd you think about what the preacher said? And what'd you think about this? And, well, you know, they tell me he's going to do that. And she said she's going to do that. She's going to, she's going to, why don't you just keep your mouth shut and let the preacher do the preaching? Amen. Let the deacons do the deacon. Amen. Why don't you just trust God to take care of his church? Amen. But when we call over here and we whisper over that and we insinuate this, you know, and, and then... And then then that, and that new man, he doesn't seem like he's much to me. Then what we're doing is we're, we're giving room for others, their minds to run away, and we're sowing discord among brethren. How serious is it? I don't know. But he didn't just say he hated his tongue. So what are you going to do with it? I'm going to believe it. And it's going to frighten me and be a deterrent in my life and in my mind. It's going to help me keep my mouth shut. If you're not, if you're not a part of the problem, and you're not the cause of the problem, you're not a cure for the problem, if you talk about it, you're just gossiping. Oh, me. I mean, we think we're God's gift to the world. We can unravel all these mysteries, and we give everyone our philosophy. And, but you see, if you read this verse, it'll make you want to shut your jaws down and let the Lord have his way. Just say, well, I'd just rather not get involved in that. Let me tell you what the Lord said. He said, these six things doth the Lord hate. Seven are an abomination unto him. Now, do you love the Lord? Would you say amen? amen. I, I think I do. He said, if you love me, keep my word. I really believe I love him. And if I love him just because I love him, I want to be real sensitive to what he's for and what he's against. And if I'm not sure, if I'm not really sure it's wrong, I'd rather just kind of stare around it. And I mean, if I'm not even sure it's wrong, because I'm in love with him. And I wouldn't want to hurt him or offend him in any way. And it's not worth it, so I just... I mean, I like pepperoni on my pizza, but if she don't like to smell it, then I'll just do it out. And, and if you realize how sensitive, and God is sensitive. And the Holy Spirit's the most sensitive person in this room, including your wife. The Holy Spirit is the most sensitive person in this room. He's so sensitive, it ain't funny. The least little thing can grieve him, offend him, and he'll be gone. Why, during an invitation, you shouldn't even, let you, you shouldn't even think about something on the outside. You ought to be praying and seeking the face of the Lord and singing or doing whatever. You shouldn't be putting on your coat and getting ready. You see, that, that, that quenches the Spirit. When you come to the altar, stay down here and pray. Those folks are not going to come this way while you're going that way. Come and pray until your heart's satisfied and then pray for others and pray for the invitation and pray for the pastor. And, and the, oh, you so say, our pastor is not that touchy, but the Holy Spirit is. He's so touchy. So sensitive that he hates that lying tongue. And he hates hands that shed innocent blood, whatever the theater there. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. He hates these old filthy dreamers just sit around and, and you did that in school today. He hates that. You did that on the way home from work. 
He hates that. You heard something on the radio, and it just kind of triggered your mind, and you see how that reminds me of so-and-so, and back when I was in college, and, and here you go. You better keep a leash on that thing. Oftentimes, just about every day, I just have to shake my head and say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I plead the blood of Jesus. And when, when I do that, then, then my mind will change. Because if you entertain that thing, oh, it'll go wild. But if you plead the blood and quote a verse, any verse comes to your mind, just quote a verse, the devil will get out. <clears throat> Discipline, maintenance. He said, I hate feet that are swift to run, to be rude and vulgar and ill-mannered and boastful and and I hate he that soweth discord among brethren which is the church the people of God the family of God is it possible that you and I could be in love with Jesus and still have something in our lifestyle whether it's what we say or what we do or how we look or whatever <clears throat> something about us that God hates let's stand please and bow our heads and no one moving around no one leaving <clears throat> eternal God our heavenly father God of all truth thank you for the word of God that liveth and abideth forever Thank you for a group of people, Lehigh Valley Baptist Church, who are interested in revival. And thank you for men and women, boys and girls, young people that are willing to pay the price. And, and Lord, we know it's not just some little deal where you drop it on us. Because you said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin, and heal their land. So the ball is in our court. It's our move. And Lord, help us during this invitation to, to move, to take a step toward your holiness, to take a step toward practical righteousness, to take a step toward truth. Lord, give strength and grace to the best people in this audience to come to this altar tonight. The very best men and women and young people in this church to come to this altar tonight. Lord, you know this chunk of flesh we live in and all of its ups and downs and emotions and lust and cravings. and Lord, you know more about us than we know about ourselves. And, and you've, you've given us this Bible to expose ourselves to ourselves and to show us how we need to repent live on our knees. Thank you for the wonderful opportunity to seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. And then the revival, all the extra power and energy and enthusiasm that will come into our lives and our personalities. Perhaps our children will be converted, maybe our neighbors, maybe someone we've prayed for for years will see them come to Christ because we were willing to pay that price for revival. Help us, I pray. Heavenly Father, you know those who are unsaved. You know the liar. You know the liar. Lord, you know who's unsaved. May you give them a personal invitation to come to Christ tonight with a repentant heart and believe the gospel and be forever saved. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Please continue to to pray. Don't allow your thoughts to go anywhere. Just stay right here and pray. And our brother's going to play. Our sister's going to play softly on the piano. And we invite you to come. Just come. No one's going to ask you any questions. It's none of our business. No one's going to cross-examine you. Just come on to Jesus. Fall on your face before Him. He knows. He understands. He cares. And praise God, He will forgive. He said, if we confess our sins, means you always will and just that means you always can faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness thank you others need to come please come you're not saying yes or no to the pastor or the evangelist
honey, you're dealing with God. You're dealing with the one that keeps your heart beating and keeps your babies alive. You're dealing with God, the one that protects you on the highway. You're dealing with God. Won't you come tonight? You're saying yes or no to God. If you're a Christian, you're saying yes or no to your Savior. Won't you come tonight? Pastor, I believe you should say a word before we pray.